Hey there students, thank you for being part of this presentation. My name is Luis Silva. Today we're looking at the scientific revolution, which is from about the 1550s all the way to the 1700s. The scientific revolution is one of the most important periods in world history as it gave birth to modern science as we know it today. Let's build some background into the scientific revolution. In the 1500s, Europe was undergoing dramatic changes. The Renaissance was well underway. During the Renaissance, as you know, great advances were being made in the arts, in writing, in education. The stage was set for another revolution, but this time in the way people were thinking. During the 1500s and 1600s, a handful of brilliant individuals laid the foundations for science as we know it today. Some historians consider this development of modern science as one of the most important events in the intellectual history of all of humankind. So it is an extremely important event. It, it laid out the foundation for science exactly as we know it today. Defining the Scientific Revolution The Scientific Revolution refers to historical changes in thought and belief. It changed social and institutional organizations. It began with Nicholas Copernicus, who asserted a heliocentric or sun-centered cosmos, and it ended with Isaac Newton, who proposed universal laws in a mechanical universe. It emphasized systematic experimentation as the most valid research method, which resulted in developments in mathematics, physics, astronomy, biology, and chemistry. All of those topics that you get to study in high school and even when you go to a university. Now, these developments transformed the views of society about nature. So our world was changing from the old world into the modern world. By the way, I do want to make the point that historians have consistently disputed the presumed beginning and ending dates of much of the scientific revolution. But at the end of the day, this does not really matter. What matters is what came out of the scientific revolution. Between 1500 and 1700, Modern science emerged as a new way of gaining knowledge about the world. Before this time, Europeans relied on two main sources for their understanding of nature. First, it was the Bible and religious teachings. The Bible dominated most of the world, in this case, Europe, and the people believed what the Bible said. But the other way was the work of classical thinkers, especially the philosopher Aristotle, which had a completely different perspective on the world, as we're going to see. Roots of the Scientific Revolution During the Renaissance, many thinkers began to question the conclusions of early thinkers. For example, Renaissance scholars rediscovered the cultures of ancient Greece and Rome. Arab, Christian, and Jewish scholars in the Muslim world translated many classical works, they also made advances of their own in such fields as medicine, astronomy, and mathematics. Many European philosophers were influenced by the Greek rationalism. This was the belief that reason or logical thought could be used to discover the basic truth about the world. Renaissance thinkers also observed nature directly. The Renaissance physician Lysilius dissected corpses to test ancient ideas about the body. Trust in reason and observation became a key part of modern science and is exactly what we use today in modern science. So this time period impacted our world like never before. During the scientific revolution, scientists challenged traditional teachings about nature. They asked fresh questions and they answer them in completely new ways. A good example is Aristotle's description of falling objects. Aristotle has said that heavier objects fall to the ground faster than lighter. This idea obviously 
seems logical or seemed logical at that time. But the Italian scientist Galileo started to question it. He started to ask himself, how is this possible? And he proved basically that this particular way of thinking was not correct. Galileo performed a demonstration in the city of Pisa where he was teaching. He dropped two balls of different weights from the city's leaning tower. They all expected the heavier ball to land first. Instead, the two balls landed at the same time. Galileo's demonstration is an application of the scientific method. He disproved Aristotle's old theory through observation. Very important. One of the key components of the scientific world is observation. And Aristotle, in this case, belief of falling objects was completely wrong because Galileo proved them wrong. Prior to the scientific revolution, there was one theory that dominated science. And that theory about Earth was the geocentric theory, which geo means Earth, centric means center. For nearly 2,000 years, most people believed that Earth was the center of the universe. Aristotle had thought this theory. The Bible also seemed to support this particular th theory as well. Unfortunately, this belief made it hard to explain the observed movement of planets such as Mars and Jupiter. This theory was challenged by Nicholas Copernicus, which came up with the heliocentric theory. Helio means sun, centric means center. In the early 1500s, Nicholas Copernicus tackled this problem using observations and mathematics. He proposed a very different idea. According to his heliocentric theory, Earth and the other planets travel in orbits around the sun. The sun is at the center of this solar system, according to Nicholas Copernicus. Earth also turn on its own axis every 24 hours. This turning explains why heavenly objects seem to move around Earth. Very important foundation for modern science. Remember, for 2,000 years, Aristotle had actually thought that Earth was the center of the universe. And uh, here comes Nicholas in the 1500s, and it says, no, in this case, the sun is the center of the universe. Completely changed the way of thinking for almost 2,000 years. And here you have Aristotle who basically came up with a geocentric model. And uh, he lived roughly 384 to 322 BC. And uh, you also have Nicholas Copernicus who lived from 1473 to 1543 and this is basically the models that you see to the top right you see the, the geocentric model in which you see there at the center earth and then you see like planets revolving around earth and uh, here comes Nicholas Copernicus and completely destroys the geocentric model and uh, he comes up with the heliocentric theory which if you see there at the left or right bottom you see that the sun is the center of the universe, according to Nicholas Copernicus. Let's move on to see what other scientists thought about science during this time. Now we're going to see what Johannes Kepler actually said. In the early 1600s, a German scientist, Johannes Kepler, expanded on Copernicus' theory. After studying detailed observations, remember the key here of the scientific revolution is observations. Kepler figured out that the orbits of the planets were oval, not circles. With this insight, he wrote precise mathematical laws describing the planet's movements around the sun. Kepler's laws agreed beautifully with actual observations. This agreement was evidence that Copernican theory was correct. Once the theory took hold, people would never again hold the same view of Earth's place in the universe. Remember, before this, people thought that Earth was the center, basically, and the sun actually revolved around Earth, but it was the opposite, which was proven by these brilliant scientists. 
Now let's look at Galileo Galilei, who lived at the same time as Johannes Kepler. He disproved Aristotle's theory that heavy objects fall faster than lighter ones. He made other discoveries about motions as well. Galileo's biggest discovery came in 1609 when he decided to build his own telescope. He figured out how telescope worked. He learned how to grind glasses for lenses. Soon he was building more and more powerful telescopes. Galileo's discoveries contradicted the traditional views of the universe. For example, Aristotle had thought that the moon was perfectly smooth. Galileo saw that it wasn't. Aristotle had said that Earth was the only center of motion in the universe. Galileo saw moons moving around Jupiter. Really, really important scientist who brought many, many discoveries into the scientific world, which we use today. Galileo's discoveries supported the Copernican heliocentric theory and led him into a bitter conflict with the Catholic Church. Church of officials feared that attacks on the geocentric theory could lead people to doubt the church's teachings. In 1616, the Catholic Church reacted and warned Galileo not to teach the Copernican theory. Galileo refused to be silenced. In 1632, he published a book called The Dialogue of the Two Chief World Systems. Galileo's dialogue caused an uproar. In 1633, the Pope called Galileo to Rome to face the Catholic court, known as the Inquisition. So basically, Galileo got in trouble for using science to prove that the old way of thinking was completely wrong, and that this new way of thinking was the correct one. At Galileo's trial, church leaders accused him of heresy. In other words, they accused him of teaching bad things, incorrect things. They demanded that he confess his error. At first, Galileo resisted. In the end, the court forced him to swear that the geocentric theory was true. He was forbidden to write about the Copernican theory. However, the church opposition could not stop the spread of Galileo's idea. Scientists across Europe read his dialogue, and these people supported his idea. They saw the evidence that he had presented, and his theory was able to spread through all Europe as well as the world. Galileo's studies of motion also advanced the scientific revolution. Like Kepler, he used observation and mathematics to solve scientific problems. Now we're moving on to Isaac Newton and the law of gravity. Isaac Newton was born in England in 1642, the same year Galileo died. Newton was a brilliant scientist and mathematician. His greatest discovery was the law of gravity. Gravity is the force of attraction between all masses in the universe. Newton told a story about his discovery. He was trying to figure out what kept the moon traveling in its orbit around the sun. Since the moon was in motion, why didn't it fly off into space and in a straight line? Then Newton saw an apple fall from a tree and hit the ground. Newton realized that when objects fall, they fall forward or towards the center of earth. He wondered if the same force that pulled the apple to the ground was tugging on the moon. The difference was that the moon was far away and Newton reasoned that the force was just strong enough to bend the moon's motion into an oval orbit around earth. Really interesting perspective of Isaac Newton. Newton in this case has become one of the most important scientists of the scientific revolution. A lot of his findings, a lot of his discoveries are used today to empower scientists to be more thoughtful about what they present to people. Let's move on to the next slide. Now let's talk a little bit about the scientific method. A key outcome of the scientific revolution was the development of the scientific method. A scientific method is basically a step-by-step -step method of investigating or investigation involving observations in theory to test scientific assumptions. Two philosophers who influenced this development were Francis Bacon and René Descartes, really important 
individuals that contributed to the scientific method. Francis Bacon was born in England in 1561. He outlined a method of scientific investigation that depended on close observations. As you can see here, as we study this, observation has become a key component of the scientific revolution. And it's the same components that you have basically in terms of observation for all of science. René Descartes was born in France in that year 1596. To gain knowledge that was certain, he said people should doubt every statement until logic proved it to be true. Descartes also saw the physical universe as obeying universal mathematical laws. These ideas helped create a new approach to science. Over time, scientists developed this approach into the scientific method. The scientific method combines logic, mathematics, as well as observation. It has five basic steps that we are going to be seeing shortly. By the way, really important, I mentioned this to you before, mathematics is a key component of all studies. Logic is a key component of all studies. Observation is a key component of all studies. And all of this was put together during the scientific revolution. Here are the steps in the scientific method that we've been talking about. Step one is state a question or a problem. State two, you form a hypothesis. Step three, conduct an experiment to test the hypothesis. Step four, measure data and record results. And the last step is analyze the data to determine if the hypothesis is correct. Once again, this is the scientific method. This is what came out of the scientific revolution. This is what we use today in science. And here we have a fantastic view that brings back memories about all of those scientists that worked so hard and risked even their lives to prove how Earth and the sun really work and all of the other planets. It's an amazing accomplishment with limited resources, unlike today that we have advanced telescopes, we have advanced machines that help us come up with all of the scientific discoveries during this particular time period. People had limited tools and they made the most of it. We have come to the end of this presentation. Please do not forget to subscribe as we will be focusing on world history, as well as United States history, and I will see you next time.